Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Animesh Chatterjee and I am a final year PhD student at Leeds Trinity University and University of Leeds, uh, where I'm studying what I call the social life of electricity in colonial Calcutta, where I look at the different political and cultural meanings of electricity that come from conflicts of gender politics, identity politics, British national, British colonialism, Indian Bengali nationalism, etc. And today I'm just going to talk about sort of a mixture of a couple of chapters in my thesis where I look at anti-colonial representations of electricity and the meanings that come from sort of Bengali anti-nationalists trying to make sense of British colonialism and they use electricity as a metaphor for Western colonialism and technological modernity. So I'm going to start with 20th September 1911, where British-owned newspapers, The Statesman in Calcutta and The Bombay Gazette in Bombay, reported the introduction of electric lights in the ancient Hindu temple of Kaligat in Calcutta. Now, the temple's not ancient, it's, it's around 300 years old, but, but there used to be sort of religi religious worship at that place for at least 100 years before that. As a modern technology bringing light into the dark recesses of a Hindu temple, the newspapers and electrical trade journals, the Electrical Review in London, the Popular Electricity, uh, Popular Electricity in Chicago, and the Journal of Electricity, Power and Gas in San Francisco, who widely reported the news a month later, presented the introduction of electric lighting as a latest triumph of technological modernity over the traditional and religious beliefs and practices of Orthodox Hindus, who, as the journalist transcripts tell us, were bitterly opposed for they felt it would be sacrilege to introduce anything modern into their religion. And this is a quote from Popular Electricity, which says, like, this is looked upon as one of the greatest victories modern electrical progress has won in India. For up to a very short time ago, no one believed it possible to obtain permission to use such a modern appliance as the electric light in one of the old temples. Now, such idealization served to reconcile the rhetoric of modern electrical progress with the practices and narratives of imperialism and colonialism. In her recent works, Uta Asanol, arguing for a critical reading of electric supply and illumination to recognize their role as instruments of power in the colonized world, has shown how colonial governments and electrical suppliers and promoters cultivated a fairly specific and strong description of electric lighting as part of the British civilizing mission to bring light associated with pro progress to the dark colonies. Now, our ability to examine the details of the introduction of electric lighting into Kaligat is, however, severely limited by the archive. The lack of an archive at Kaligat and the silence of institutional archives means that accounts and voices of the colonized other, in this case, the Orthodox Hindus, are obviously missing. Now, this leaves us with governmental and journalistic archives, which, as existing historical studies on the electrification of colonial Calcutta and colonial India, demonstrate they only allow historians to write triumphalist narratives of electrical modernity and electrification. Now, electrification, as Graham Goode has shown in his, in his book, Domesticating Electricity, electrification is a very sort of strange term to use as a historian because it kind of denotes the inevitable use of electricity in homes and public spaces. So, and it's, it's kind of, and it, it links electricity with modernity. But my intention of beginning this paper with this sketchy history of electric lighting in Kaligat is to actually challenge such colonial and triumphalist nar narratives and ask, what would a history of the political and cultural meanings of electricity in colonial Calcutta look from outside the confines of governmental archives and technocratic sources? And keeping in mind this question and considering the aims of this workshop to bring into conversation the history of science and technology, environmental history, and what talking much about environmental history, but I'm talking about the urban environment here, uh, and literary studies through an examination of narratives. In this paper, I reveal some of the different, sometimes incompatible conceptions of electricity that coexisted in the cultural and political imaginations and narratives of vastly different commentators and audiences. Now, to do so, I adopt an approach that examines vernacular archival sources, writings, images, dramatic performances, produced by anti-colonial nationalists and traditionalist sections of the Bengali middle-class gentlemanly or Bhadralok intelligentsia. And I use these archives in conjunction with existing technocratic and colonial archives 
in order to sort of get this whole picture of what people were talking about electricity at this time. Now I have, I have divided this presentation into two parts. The first I will, I will look at how different representations of electricity as a western technology existed uh, in colonial Bengal and in colonial Calcutta sorry. And in the second part I will look at how anti-colonial and, tradi and traditionalist narratives question the place of electricity in the urban environment. So Calcutta's exposure to electric lighting begins in 1875. So in December 1875, the uh, Prince of Wales comes to Calcutta uh, and basically to, to welcome him, there's one electric lamp at the top of government house in Calcutta, in, amongst all the other gas lamps and oil lamps that were placed. But there was, so this is a map of Calcutta and this is from 1903. But it's very colonial in its way that it's Calcutta shown as London. The river actually flows north to south. <laughs> so north is this way, south is this way. But it's, it's, it's shown in a way, because Calcutta was second city of the empire, it's, it's shown in a way that it looks similar to London with all the sort of colonial bits right here with all the green spaces and, and, and the fort and, and government house and all the government offices in here. So government house has one lamp on top of it and it's provided by P.W. Fleury who's a British engineer who sort of lives and works in, in, in Calcutta. He has his company in Calcutta from 1875 onwards and he does a lot of demonstrations and, and sort of the, the coming of the Prince of Wales sort of kickstarts his business in a way and he, he does a lot of demonstrations in his house in Dharamtala. He lives somewhere in this area which is very close to the colonial center and he does a lot of performances of electric lighting from his house and his rooftop and he invites a lot of colonial and uh, sort of Bengali elites to, to see all the new technologies that he has. So on 16 July 1876, uh, the Indian Daily News reported a performance of electric lighting at Fleury's residence which according to the report was watched with great interest by a large number of all classes because it was done from his rooftop. And so in the following years, readers of newspapers and periodicals would have encountered writings on and illustrations on and advertisements of electricity and electrical machines public, published with a view to inform readers of the effects and uses of electricity. Newspapers, both English and Bengali, constantly published the wonders and dangers of electricity and electric lighting. The nationalist newspaper, The Hindu Patriot, on 6 January 1879, reported the improvements made to electric lighting by Thomas Edison ending the article with a jibe at the Calcutta Municipal Corporation for their long-term contract with gas supply. So it's, the article ends with saying, like, why does Calcutta Municipal Corporation have a 21-year contract with, the ga with gas supply when electricity is the new thing and the best thing to have? But in addition, promoters of electrical goods, certain sections of the Bengali middle-class intelligentsia and the colonial government all created and propagated connections between electricity, colonialism, and Western technological modernity. For example, in May 1876, Rajendra Lal Mitra, representing the scientific nationalist organization, the Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science, founded by the Bengali nationalist Mahendra Lal Sarkar in 1876. He, so uh, Rajendra Lal Mitra basically delivers a lecture on electricity to an audience comprised of colonial and Bhadrarok elites at the Family Literary Club. And here he directly connects the use of electricity as central to the European civilization of modern days. He says, electricity was the grandest, the most awe-inspiring and all-pervading power in nature. And what has the European civilization of the modern days done with it? Why? It has forced that form of electricity called the magnetic to serve as our most trusted guide in the trackless ocean. It has obliged the subtle fluid to become the most rapid carrier of messages, girdling the earth as our carriers. It has converted it in, into the burnisher of our domestic vessels, coating our pots and pans, cups and saucers with gold or silver, according to our wishes, it has employed the magnetic current to ring our car bells and forge our platinum vessels to give us light at our command and to blow up obstructions in the beds of rivers and seas. So he basically sees like, this is what Western civilization is doing with electricity. And he compares, he basically has this long list of things that, that the West is doing with electricity. 
The very representations that claimed electricity and electric lighting as being products of European and modern civilization also invited anti-colonial nationalists to portray electricity as a harbinger of radical change capable of disrupting traditional urban and domestic values and schemes. So electricity became a timely tool of visual satire during the Prince of Wales's visit to Calcutta in 1875. This is Bosantuk, uh, a, a very short-lived journal. It started in 1874, went out of print in 1876. But it, it was one of the first journals to actually use satire to comment on sort of political and social issues of that time. And here we see the Prince of Wales sort of shown as this light. He's bringing light to the colonies. There's, he's controlling sort of the minds of the natives who are working for him, who are the welcoming committee. So you see a man blowing trumpets out of his ears. The, this guy is pulling a cart and pushing a cart as well. And, and he's controlling all the minds through an electric mustache. <laughs> but apart from, apart from this, there's also, uh, so in this illustration, as we see, like political and imperial power is disguised in the Prince of Wales. He's bringing light to the colonies, whose corrupting influence is shown making its way to the natives. And, and this, this illustration is important not, so, not just aesthetically as caricature, but also as a political piece of anti-colonial and traditionalist propaganda. Now here I'll also talk about a, a, a satire, a play uh, first performed in 19, 1894 uh, and sort of performed continuously at, 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 at the Star Theatre in Calcutta up till the early 1900s. Uh, so this is, this is a play called uh, The Babu, a, social, uh, society, uh, a Bengali society farce. And the Babu basically means Mr. in Bengali. So if, if we had to sort of call somebody, it's basically <coughs> Babu. Uh, and, and in that play, uh, the author, Amritalal Basu, Amritalal Basu was a famous dramatist of his time, controversial as well. Uh, so he, he basically alludes to electricity in order to satirize and criticize the inexorable beliefs of the members of the Indian Association of the Cultivation of Science in the capabilities of Western scientific and technological tools and methods to affect social, cultural, and political revolution in India. Now I have chosen satire for, for I, I have a few sources in my, in my thesis, but here I'm just going to talk about this one satire. And I use this satire for several reasons. Firstly, you know, given the nature of the vernacular archives, it is one of the rare sources that directly address electricity as a metaphor for British colonialism and Western technological modernity. What makes it important also is the history of Bengali public theatre itself. Historians have shown how the emergence of what Sudipto Chatterjee calls the democratized Bengal Bengali public theatre, with theatre moving out of sort of the homes of the elites, the, uh, the courtyards of the elites to sort of public stages where people could buy tickets and, and watch these. So it resulted in the professionalization of an otherwise amateur Bengali theater. But the public stage was also important because it allowed anti-colonial and traditionalist sections of the Padrolok to respond to contemporary social and political issues. Since the Bengali public theater was a creation of the Padrolok intelligentsia, its performances also reflected the ideological contestations and plurality of opinions in contemporary Padrolok society. Now, Chatterjee writes in his book, The Colonial Stage, he says the theatre of the Bengali intelligentsia was a performance of the desires and ambitions of the class itself. And, and, and here we sort of, so the Babu, the, the play that I'm talking about, is, is basically the, is talking about class identity. It talks about class identity, it talks about gender, it talks about British colonialism and Indian nationalism and different forms of Indian nationalism. And... It basically is a dramatization of sort of this Bhadra-like Bhadra-like nationalist endeavor. Now, the metaphorical use of electricity in the Babu was also a political strategy because with the Dramatic Performances Act in 1876, the colonial government placed a lot of, sort of censorship on, 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 on written material. So the only way people could actually get the message across was use metaphor. So here we see, so in the, th the this is, this is Babu get, later gets translated in 1911 into English. But uh, this is basically the Boshantuk again, talking about the, how the colonial government was using 
a cannon to silence the theater, which was basically a mosquito. So the dramatic performances act was the cannon. Uh, but yeah, the, one of the scenes opens with a discussion between a, a, a Hindu reformist nationalist and a Bengali scientific nationalist. Uh, and the, the reformist asks his friend to marry a widow. widow. So the, the reformist nationalist thought that sort of remarrying widows and giving women's education was the way to move forward. That is how you sort of free India from British rule. But the scientific nationalist says, well, you don't need to do that because you've got electricity. You know, if, if there's a widow and she wants a child, you basically, I, I can make a battery where she just holds, to the two, so holds the two prongs and she'll have a child in no time. Yeah. He, he says in one of, one of the, he says, except as I, I won't marry any human being. If I can produce children by means of electricity, I'll produce them. And, and this is sort of basically a satire on sort of these scientific nationalists who see sort of electricity as this Western technology that everybody should be using. And, and, and then again later he says, mark my words, if I live and I'm bound to as I eat a quantity of electricity twice a day, I will by the force of electricity abolish the caste system, affect the remarriage of widows, teach women to ride horses, establish a parliament in India, and do many other deeds besides. So he's basically satirizing the other nationalists Again, he says, if India is to be delivered, it won't be delivering lectures and remarrying widows. It will be by the help of science alone. So he's, but then there are other forms of, now we come to the urban environment. And electricity also appears in a lot of sort of nationalist, extremist nationalist propaganda where there's a call for arms against the colonial government. And this last slide sort of represents the colonial government with its institutions, electrical infrastructure, and the army. And this is what nationalists, the extremist nationalists are fighting against. And sort of in the, in the 1890s and early 1900s, we see a lot of electric lighting being introduced into the center of the colonial center of Calcutta, firstly through sort of generator and battery operated lighting, and later through the Calcutta Electric Supply Corporation. And so, and, and Calcutta Electric Supply Corporation's power, thermal power plant is based right here in the center so that it, it can provide electricity to all the important buildings and spaces in, in the colonial center of Calcutta. And the government's sort of not bothered about what's hap what happens elsewhere. And it's a very sort of visual way of separating the sort of colonial elite from the rest of the natives. And the government also sort of proposes using electric. So this is also a time when so the urban environment is changing. There's a there, there's there's fear of contagion from cholera and all these epidemics, and the government thinks, oh, we should get rid of all these native slums, and one of the ways to do it is use electric trams. So if you move the move the slums, move the people in the slums outside the colonial center, if they want to come back to work as servants in in the in these residences and offices, they can take the electric tram. It makes it easier, and the electric tram also allows separation of class by allowing two carriages rather than having a horse pull one carriage. And the European can then travel with the better class of natives. So this separation, again, in, oh, sorry, that was a bit too early. <laughs> so <laughs> so this, this separation gets, is again portrayed in, uh, in, in the play. So in, in, in one of the last sort of bits of the play, there's, there's this uh, story of, of, a, of a Bengali woman who's been asked by her husband to join her for a walk in the Maidan to see the electric lights. And she's pretty excited about it. But her friends say, well, you know, the place of Hindu woman is in the house. And this is, this is a time when sort of Bengali nationalists are trying to create the separation between the home and the outside. So the home is where you preserve Indian cultural values. And then you take that out to fight against colonialism in the outside world. But, and, and the protector and, and the curator of this Indian cultural value is the Bengali woman, whose, whose role is sort of within the house, taking care of the house and taking care of children and taking care of the Indian cultural values. And so her husband asks, this woman's husband asks her to come out with him to, to go to the Maidan. And she does go, despite her friends telling her not to. And she gets then molested by a British soldier and a Hindu traditionalist, nationalist, comes and saves the day. So 
So in that, in that bit, sort of, this colonial center, which the government, the British colonial government was trying to sanitize and make more safe for European uh, residents, residents was, was dangerous to Indian cultural values and, and was dangerous to the symbol of Indian cultural values, the Bengali woman. And so, so this is where sort of the urban environment is sort of discussed, how it's discussed in, 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 in Indian satire. So, so now to conclude, in this presentation, I have attempted to adopt an approach that brings into conversation strands from histories of technology, colonial and post-colonial studies, and histories of Bhadralok society and its complex relations with the colonial landscape. Uh, there's a, there was a lot to uncover, so I had, I've had to cut down a lot. <laughs> now with the relation to this workshop's theme, with relation to this workshop's theme, particularly, this has been an attempt to both challenge and introduce narratives both historiographical and historical. So I'm, I'm trying to challenge sort of this colonial narrative of electricity by introducing the anti-colonial perspective and saying, well, there are these different meanings of electricity that, that exist at the same time. And I do this by addressing how diverse meanings of electricity emerged and how such viewpoints were never confined to technological or scientific matters, but were deployed often polemically in discussions of social, cultural, and political beliefs between promoters, the colonial state, and sections of Bhadralok society. I can finish now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>